We're delighted to have Dr. Eric Klumpa of the Physics Department as our speaker today. Dr. Klumpa is an astronomer and aeronautical engineer with degrees from Caltech and Stanford, as well as a PhD in astronomy from the University of Texas. He spent more than a decade at NASA's Jet Propulsion Library on the Viking mission to Mars prior to joining our faculty. Each fall, he teaches the course on exploring the universe to our incoming Buchanan students. And as a special treat, we will be welcoming them back on April the 18th. Is correct. That, right? that is correct. To speak on some new developments regarding black holes, right? Sure. Yeah, OK. Uh, or, some, or something like that. OK. <laughs> Today, he's going to be talking on astronomy as a road to connecting or to connect with society and culture. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm always amazed whenever they're doing something cool over here that those two guys think of me. That always freaks me out. But uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. And I really appreciate uh, your thoughtfulness when you invite me. And um, you've been very good friends. Um, I'm a big fan of at least, it could be I'm defining the term wrongly, but I don't think I am. But a liberal education, I've been a big fan of that for a very, very long time, probably because of the role it has played in my life personally. Uh, and it's a principle that I've tried to integrate uh, into a lot of the classes I teach here at MTSU as well. So um, let's get started. The first three slides I'm going to predict look exactly like the first three slides that everybody else before me has shown you. Because none of us really knows, you know, you know, to lead into our topic, we tend to give some basic information. So I may go quickly. I'll look at your eyes. Your eyes will tell me uh, that maybe this is boring or maybe it's something new. But historically, uh, trivium is where the three roads meet. I can only need three roads, so that one's under construction. So those three roads meet, okay? <laughs> but literally, tri comes from three, via means road. And the three roads are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And if you're familiar with those details, Grammar is the beginning stage of learning anything. You're learning the vocabulary. You're learning the, the, uh, uh, like the names of the planets, for example, in astronomy would be sort of a grammar level of learning. Uh, logic is your capacity to take everything you learn at the grammar stage and make connections, make connections. See, with logic, you can take two things that were, that were stated as true at the grammar level and draw a third conclusion that wasn't even mentioned at the grammar stage and demonstrate as true. You've applied logic appropriately. Rhetoric is your capacity to take your ideas and communicate that to somebody else. Take an idea that's in your mind and place it in someone else's mind in a way they'd understand it. So rhetoric has a lot to do with your capacity to speak, uh, to write, those kinds of things. So once you become skilled with those things, then you're ready for the quadrivium, and now that road's open. Uh, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. Now this sounds strange to us. This was done, you know, you know gosh, 2,000 years ago. The Greeks did this. But basically, these are the four areas that they would, I guess, study. Uh, if you study music, particularly, I teach the physics of music. We talk a little bit about the, how the Greeks established musical scales. You'll notice their music is heavily rooted in mathematics, basically arithmetic and astronomy. And I, there's a lot of astronomy students in this room. I recognize you. But our discussion, everything prior to Kepler was heavily geometric, if you recall. So geometry was sort of like the way they, they addressed astronomy. But the point here is, you know, this sort of gets you ready to learn to the next level. And this next level, you're, you're marrying everything that people understood, everything that people formerly understood. Once you clear those seven hurdles, you're now ready uh, to, to study philosophy. Okay, and basically you guys know what that is. All right? You've seen this picture probably, what, 10 times now? But, uh, but there you go. And you understand the story behind the painting. I'm not sure if it means anything that astronomy is bringing up the rear. I won't say any more about that one. But, uh, but there we are. And as you can see, they're all philosophies leading the way, uh, bringing all these things to, the, uh, to a philosopher. So the benefits, uh, this is a list that you could probably find almost anywhere. It's pretty common stuff. But the, uh, a liberal education, this idea that you're bringing disparate or supposedly disparate ideas together, uh, you know, just to become, a, 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 I guess, a, a very broad learner. It empowers you with broad knowledge, obviously. Uh, it integrates a broad spectrum of study, which is to say you're intentionally finding connections. Uh, you know, there is a connection between history and astronomy. Take astronomy from me, and you'll see that right away. 
there's a connection between epistemology and astronomy. Okay, the, the epistemology, I'll mention that in a bit, but the study of how we know things are true. There's a connection. And there's all sorts of connections that you can make, and you can integrate them. And uh, looking to integrate ideas is, is, is a very good mental exercise. Identifying those connections is important. Um, I like to think of astronomy as a conversation starter, although when I was dating, I found it was a conversation killer. Uh, I guess that meant my technique needed some polish, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby, you want to hear about black holes? Didn't work too well. Okay, well, how about, uh, how about supernova remnants? Yeah, it just doesn't work. But, uh, but it's, um, I would think that any subject that you teach, I would argue there's, all subjects are interesting, all subjects are important, and all subjects done well generate questions. They generate questions that can, in fact, uh, uh, reach across boundaries to uh, other areas and other disciplines. Once you're there, you're in a position to talk about things like values. We'll mention the, in some of the things I'm going to mention, values, ethics, culture, society, uh, civic engagement. Oops, something interesting just happened. Um, it encourages encounters with important issues, um, important issues of the day, like a new discovery that was just made that involves gravitational waves. Whoa, that's very current. That's what I'll be talking about on August 18th. But today we'll just, we'll do, uh, just touch on just a little bit. I would argue that a liberal education is the distinction between education, which is an integrative approach, versus just basic training where you're being focused. You know, if you're being trained to do a job, okay, that's one thing. But if you're really being educated, you actually learn, you, you know a little bit more about language. You could be a physics major, but if you're being educated, you know about, about language, you know about history. Uh, maybe you've taken some art um, and uh, all the other disciplines that you've had opportunity to learn in college. Uh, so I would argue that these things are all valuable. The car analogy, th this is just, I'm going to use this in one of my closing points, so I want you to understand it. <clears throat> the car analogy, for starters, a car is an amazing device. Now, that's not just any car. That is the greatest car th <laughs> that has ever been built. You know, it's a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> I owned a Volkswagen bus forever. And, uh, uh, well, until my first child was born. And there's a story there, and I'll get to that. Okay? There's a story there. They're amazing devices. It's an integrated system okay, of propulsion. Okay? You have an engine, a fuel delivery system, and if you've worked on cars uh, or read books about cars, you know, you're going to get this explosive liquid safely from a tank into an engine, and it's got to be done in a way that maximizes efficiency. Yeah, you get the idea. It makes you go forward. You need brakes. Uh, the purpose of brakes is to dissipate kinetic energy or the energy of motion and you need to do it efficiently without overheating because brakes improperly designed could overheat and, the, and the, their effectiveness uh, deteriorates. Maneuverability, you got to make that turn or you got to avoid the pothole, those kinds of things. So a steering wheel and all the mechanisms that are connected there. Comfort, uh, you know, tires are filled with air, uh, a suspension system climate control roof, and this is where my story comes in, <laughs> climate control, uh, the way Volkswagens, they don't have air conditioners, but they do have heaters. We're talking way back in the 60s, okay, uh, early 70s type, type vehicles. What the heaters are is they, they build a box. It's a metal box that they weld around the exhaust pipe, and air goes into that box and back out, but the exhaust goes through the exhaust pipe, but doesn't get into the air box that surrounds it. So just sheer warmth warms the air. And you just turn the levers on and you get warm. Well, in my car, which happened to a lot of the older ones, there was a leak between the exhaust and the air you're breathing. When you were my age, because you're in a vocal, it was hilarious. Like, ha, 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 smell that gas. You know, it was just great. And uh, that's just part of being young and foolish, which maybe I have not graduated out of yet. Uh, the young thing, I'm past it. The foolish one, I think, is still lingering. So anyway, when my wife and I started having children, and I, I was just so proud of my car, I just realized young lungs and exhaust, they don't work. So we got rid of it, and that's been a sad day. Um, what did I graduate to? That's the question that you're all dying to know. A minivan. <laughs> Minivan's gone. I'm an empty nester, and uh, uh, I have a Harley Davidson now, so life's good. Life's good. Uh, Safety is important. Seat belts, airbags. Both of these and mine were like, what? <laughs> Crumple zone. The piece of metal, but 
my, my knees were that close to the, the front of the car. So my crumple zone was like that thick. So anyway, maybe my car wasn't very safety. But we know they're safety now. They're, they're, they're very safe now. When all the parts work well together, the ultimate purpose of the car is satisfied. Okay, I think we can all agree on that one. Okay, I intend to, oh, I intend to argue that education, properly done, is also an integrated system. This is going to lead to a point. I'm leaving it vague here on purpose, but it's going to lead to a point. What I want to do next is talk about examples of this integrated approach where you can use astronomy as a conversation starter into other areas. And I think, I think any subject can do that. I don't think astronomy holds all the trump cards in this conversation. I really don't. Uh, if you think this way, it becomes easier. Uh, it, it becomes easier as you, uh, as you uh, communicate with students. Gravitational waves, uh, particularly those coming from binary black holes. Um, Albert Einstein predicted their existence in 1916. Before I camp out on this point, let's look at this picture. Those two blue things, this is a graphic. This is something an artist put together. The point is that those two black holes are orbiting each other in very much the same manner that the moon orbits the Earth, or the way the Earth orbits the sun. They're locked in this gravitational dance. There's this mutual attraction, but the fact that they're moving in circles um, produces a balance between gravitational pull and the forces that pull them apart. And the result, you have a stable orbit that, is per that persists. Einstein was the one who showed us, and I'm going to explain all these details on the 18th, but uh, the presence of mass in space generates curved space. And if those masses are moving, then you're generating curves that are changing with respect to time, which is very much like a wave. Okay? You've got this curved surface that's changing with time, and these wave fronts move outwardly. You can almost picture yourself putting your finger and making a little circle and look at the wave pattern. The trouble with that is there'd be splashes, and uh, uh, there's other factors that don't make it easy to reproduce uh, in your bathtub at home. But it's that kind of a thing. What I want to camp out on is the idea that he predicted in 1916, because what year is this? I'm doing something, obviously, it's very dumb. OK, there we go. There we go. Maybe I. But uh, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, and there's two of them, one in Louisiana, one in, one in Washington State. And we'll, we'll talk about why they have to be so far away from each other on August 18th. It detected the first gravitational wave on February 11, 2016. This does not mean a gravitational wave hit Earth on the first, for the first time in February. That does not mean that. They've been doing it all the time. There's probably one hitting you right now, and I apologize. <laughs> Nothing personal about that. It's just that we got to a stage where not only did we know what we were looking for, we knew how to look for it. And when those two things come together, okay, uh, you make a detection. What I like about this is, a hundred years after somebody, now you have to remember, this is a guy, okay, who was working as a Swiss patent clerk, right? And we know some of his greatest work came out of that period of his life. This may sound <coughs> peculiar, but in some way, he was not hampered or hindered by the tenure system. Because within the tenure system, trying to get tenure, it's a different type of research that you do when you're trying to get tenure, relative to the type of research you can do after you get tenure. All right? Well, not being a part of that system, he didn't have to worry about producing work that was controversial, that maybe those who were in seniority over him would have a problem with, and choose to not promote it. You know, uh, politics and education? Nah, it can never happen. No, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. But that's one of the things about, you know, you learn to get along with people, you learn to work with people, uh, and you can get through those, uh, those types of situations pretty well. But not being a part of that system gave him a free reign to do a lot of things, a lot of creative thinking. And one of those things was uh, uh, um, the photoelectric effect, which is what, for what he got the Nobel Prize. And then, of course, relativity was another thing that he did during that period. The validation of a century old prediction, okay, that's the part I want to say just right now, okay, because we're talking about, um, about a liberal education. Imagine at a time when this idea that, I mean, everybody up until then would have argued that space and time are, are, are absolutes, OK? And what's relative is the way things move relative to each other. And then Einstein comes along, and he takes this idea, and he flips it on its head. 
He says the speed of light is the absolute. The speed of light is constant for all observers, for all reference frames. What happens is space and time will deform. Space and time will change in a way that always keeps the speed of light constant for all observers. A consequence of that is moving meter sticks are not a meter long, they're shorter. Clocks that are moving through space will actually run slowly. And you're like, that's impossible, that doesn't make sense. But at the time, that's how radical this was. That's how radical these ideas were. And he's predicting that not only uh, that those effects that I just mentioned, but gravity waves, the idea that space is a fabric, and just like any other medium, like water, is a medium that can sustain waves. Air is a medium that can sustain waves. You're hearing my voice right now. There's the experiment that shows that's true. Space itself, okay, space devoid of matter and energy, just empty space itself, is like a fabric that can sustain these perturbations. 100 years, we, we detect it. And this is exciting because you would argue that science done well is when you investigate a phenomenon, you understand it, you generate a model that gives you a capacity to predict an observation no one's ever seen before. Well, if you could make a prediction that came true in a month, you go, whoa, this guy did 100 years. He was so far ahead of the game, we didn't even have the tools to build the experiment to, to measure what he was predicting. So to me, this really uh, opens up interesting questions in epistemology, the idea of how do we know things are true, the scientific method. Some people think the scientific method is whatever the smartest guy in the room says, or the loudest guy, or the guy with the most followers. Um, sometimes we do do things that way, but uh, I would say science done well probably doesn't fit in that camp. This is important. In 2003, three, uh, three theorists, Bordick, Guth, and uh, Lenkin, they published a paper indicating that one of the consequences of general relativity, which is this, uh, the theory that, that Einstein predicted, is that almost all inflationary models of the universe will reach a boundary in the past, meaning our universe probably doesn't exist infinitely into the past. This actually is connected with what Einstein referred to as his biggest mistake of his career. Okay? He was arguing, uh, like a lot of scientists in his day, that not only is the universe eternal, it goes on forever. Okay? And a lot of us, if you think that today, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, experimentally, it has been established since general relativity is now basically uh, uh, a very well-established um, model for how the universe works. You're stuck with the idea that the universe is finite in age and it has to have a causal agent. Something brought the universe into existence. And the, and the universe can't bring itself into existence because the laws of physics as we understand them were also created at that same singularity. So what are the laws of physics that brought the universe into existence? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's an interesting question, and you can see that leads to a lot of other questions, uh, very, very important questions. But now we've got a multi multidisciplinary uh, <coughs> idea on the table. We can talk about the math, um, philosophy, you know, does, does time really go on forever? Well, philosophers tend to describe time differently than scientists do. But uh, to a scientist, we'd say time, as you and I experience it, does not go on forever. Uh, theology, because people would point out that maybe there's some sort of a causal agent. And if you look at the universe as being a very well put together system, maybe that causal agent has intent, okay? Or maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just some sort of a multi-universe type of uh, structure. But it does generate questions on ultimate things and, uh, and what would cause the universe to come into existence. Maybe we can talk about what's gonna take the universe out of existence, those types of questions. I think these are all fun questions and interesting questions and it gets us out of the pure astronomy. Exoplanets. This is something that's huge. A lot of us hear about this. The current status. What do we know about exoplanets? Okay. This picture here uh, is pretty important. Um, I'll get back to this in a few minutes. Let's go over here. Generally, the most popular definition of Earth 2.0 goes back to the work of Carl Sagan published 50 years ago. And you guys know Carl Sagan. He's a science popularizer. The way astronomers joke about him is he's the only astronomer who actually could pull off an interview on the Johnny Carson show. The rest of us would have just killed it. I mean, I mean not in the good sense. We would have never invited back. So he, he, he is very good in front of a camera, uh, very intelligent. He had a, uh, his, his Cosmos series is still, uh, is still enjoyed by many people. And one of the things he published in the 1960s was what he would describe as the basic or fundamental ingredients uh, for there to be an exoplanet, a planet that uh, would be Earth-like, okay? 
One has to do with, is the planet terrestrial? The second one is the planet in a habitable zone. And thirdly, the, uh, what is the host star like? Now, I'm being very, very black and white here. All, these are like zones of fuzziness that all inter, inter, intersect. But I'm trying to use terms that we can all pick up on right away and immediately engage in a conversation with me right now about these things. The size of a planet is important because the surface conditions on the planet have to, acco have to accommodate, um, have, have to uh, allow you to have conditions, temperature and pressure, that are close to the triple point <coughs> of water. If you're not the triple point of water, you can't have a stable water cycle. And for a lot of reasons, which I can't get into right now, a planet devoid of water is not considered a habitable site. So a planet that has just the right amount of surface gravity, it can't be too big, or the, or the, or the atmosphere is too heavy, and it's too small, it's like the moon, no atmosphere. So you've got to have just the right size. To be in the habitable zone has to do with temperature, because you take an Earth-like planet, okay, you move it too close to the sun, now you've got a situation where a liquid water, even though in theory it should have a stable water cycle, will no longer have one. And of course, the type of star. When I say sun-like, I mean yellow stars or stars that are very similar to the sun that are yellow, uh, as opposed to red, which are the smallest stars, and blue, which are the largest ones. And the reason those tend to get ruled out right away is blue stars go through, they're blue because they're using up energy at a very high rate, so they're very hot. Blue stars, because they go through energy so quickly, they will typically supernova long before any planets that are around them could host life. They supernova way too quickly. Okay, and that's a very explosive event. And red stars, they're so cold that the terrestrial planets, if they existed, would be so close, they would be despun. Okay, the closer you get to a host star, the more likely your planet will be despun by the gravitational effects of your host star. Mercury and Venus are both very good examples. Uh, probably more Mercury than Venus. And then you look at our moon. Our moon has been despun. That's, you know, those kind of things. So, uh, so uh, and, and a planet that doesn't spin has a hot side and a cold side, which means you don't have liquid water, you don't have a stable water cycle anywhere on the planet. So you say the middle of the ground is what we're going for. But this is the kind of thing that uh, Carl Sagan would have mentioned back in the 60s. Um, today, we know the definition of Earth-like possesses over 100 critical elements. And I'm willing to say maybe even 200. And uh, there's things like the ratio of uh, surface area of your planet that has water to continent. Magnetic fields, the presence of magnetic fields, uh, those kinds of questions. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a host of those. And by the way, that list of 100 is the result of biologists, geologists, those types of folks, physicists. It's a very, very wide range of scientists all collaborating together uh, to produce those numbers. So, so this is the byproduct of an integrative approach that includes geologists, biologists, chemists, physicists, astronomers, and so forth. And so you've got this idea of what, what, what does it mean to be, uh, be Earth-like. But we still live with these three, even though we have these other lists. And the reason for that is we have spacecraft in orbit right now that have the capacity to measure things like these three. And so even though we know, we know enough to know that the checklist that you have to check off as to what constitutes an Earth-like planet is long, we live with these three because we at least need a starting point. We need a starting point. What I've done here is, this is really a data cube. It looks like a plane. It looks like it's got height and width, but it actually extends into the third dimension. And the three dimensions correspond to those three things I gave you uh, on the previous slide. The mass of the host star. This means the degree to which it is sun-like. The semi-major axis. This means how close it is to the sun. Okay? Is it close enough or far enough away that liquid water could exist? And the one that's missing is how big is the planet itself, which tells you if it's Earth-like. So we're kind of looking through the data. By the way, uh, I tried to get very recent results. This was recent as of March 17th. I'm sorry, that's not like yesterday. <laughs> but uh, it's close enough. And this came straight off the website. And what I've done here is, that represents the sun. Or, and if you want to say sun-like, then you just open your fingers up and go like this. You see that? All right, just trying to keep it simple. This represents uh, 1 AU. That's where the Earth is, okay? And this looks really promising. Uh, that means uh, Venus, and that means Mars, okay? And the reason I bring these guys into the picture is, funny as it may seem, the most Earth-like planet using the criterion established by Carl Sagan is Venus. But yet, if you went there, it would melt lead. You see, we really, Earth-like 
is really much more complicated. And Mars isn't that far away in terms of uh, being Earth-like as well. Because Venus, when I was a child, we were taught that it was Earth's twin because the temperatures of the upper atmosphere match the temperatures of the upper atmosphere of the Earth. But we've done a lot of study of Venus since then, and we now know it's got a lot about it that's uniquely uh, different from, from the Earth. And so we've learned a lot. But the experiments that we have, that we're doing today, Kepler spacecraft is one of them. If Kepler described, if, excuse me, if Kepler discovered a perfect twin to Venus, they would have no way of knowing it. It would probably be flagged as Earth-like. Okay, and then we all get excited. You know, we're all building spaceships. Let's go talk to these guys. When you get there, your lead spaceship melts. And you go, oh, maybe that wasn't a good idea after all. So, but, but it's a good conversation. I drew a little box around there, and you go, hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, the question that's unanswered because it's, it's been suppressed, it's this dimension, is are, are the dots that are inside that box Earth-like? Now, what I've done is I've rotated the data cube now. So this tells you if it's Earth-like. Now we've got that data point, and this is still whether it's sun-like. So there's the sun. That's the Earth, that's Venus, and that's Mars. Okay, and if you draw a box around that, you see, oh, okay, from this perspective, because remember, it's a data cube, it's three dimensions, you go, oh, things aren't looking too good there, but that's okay. And uh, the, what's been suppressed is, are they in a habitable zone? And then lastly, it's the third view. If you see three groups, you're doing very well. NASA has given these names, hot Jupiters, mini Neptunes, super Earths, okay? You see that, they're all there, all three of them. I have, I need to take a class <laughs> on how to use this thing. And I probably would fail it. I'll take it twice, I promise. Okay, but, uh, but here we have, we're, we're back at the Earth. Okay, and that is the uh, one AU. That's Venus, that's Venus orbit, that's Mars, and that's Mars's orbit. If we box that area in, yeah, you start to realize. This does not mean that Earth 2.0 does not exist, or Venus 2.0, or, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, it doesn't, or Vulcan, hey, let's go for that one. Vulcan 2.0, all right? That doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is, given our capacity to detect exoplanets, we still have a lot of work to do. That's all that means. The hardest thing to detect is a small planet that's at a comfortable distance from the sun. That is very hard to do, considering how many light years we have to look. But this is fun because what kind of questions is this? What kind of questions does this raise? Okay, uh, two thousand exoplanets. That, that, those data. That was all of them. I didn't leave any off. Okay, uh, most have been verified. It, it makes it extremely difficult. Okay, so technology is getting there. I'm sure we'll be seeing a, a lot of similar type planets to the Earth uh, before long. Currently, the most Earth-like planets known, other than Earth, are Venus and Mars. Uh, and clearly they're not. You don't have a stable water cycle on either of those. Not to mention neither one of them has a magnetic field either. And you, in the absence of a magnetic field, solar radiation would just destroy all your, uh, uh, it, it would damage your skin. Uh, cells cannot survive. Even single cellular life cannot survive without sufficient protection from solar wind. Um, but this necessitates a conversation on what, what Earth-like means. We need to have a conversation about that. And uh, that's a fun thing to talk about. You know, you have optimists versus pessimists. You know, optimists are very optimistic, which is to say the list that they would give you is very short. Pessimists would give you a list that's extremely long. And I would argue that all aspects of science should participate. Uh, biologists know a lot of things about life. So do chemists. Could we travel to other Earths? This is a question because what are we dealing with? You know, every so often you read a news article that talks about diminishing resources. It talks about how maybe Earth isn't doing as well as it could in terms of pollution and other things. And so the idea that we could travel to other Earths, uh, and there's a, this has to do with engineering, psychology, and sociology. I did a talk on this a long time ago, and I listed all the things that make people, traditionally cause people to commit murder, and then I listed all the things that are typical for a multi-generational flight to another planet in a confined box. The lists are almost the same. <laughs> <laughs> Limited resources, confined, lack of sunlight, the list goes on and on. But yet all of us will sign up to go. <laughs> you have no idea what you're asking to do. So, uh, but that's a, that's a fun talk if you're ever interested. Um, um, it does give us a mandate to take better care of Earth. You know, this is a rock solid argument, you know. You know, conservation, recycling, take care of what we have. What we have is very valuable. Uh, is it unique, you know? Uh, Goldilocks, the Goldilocks criteria is, is this planet too big? Is this planet too small? Does this planet spin too quickly? Does this planet spin too slowly? 
the Copernican principle is, the, is, is a philosophical idea that has found its way into astronomy based on a, a Nicholas Copernicus work, is that whatever describes Earth can't be unique. Anything that describes Earth has to be general or has to be, um, uh, it's not a singular point. It's, uh, the Earths are quite common. So it's kind of a philosophical idea, but it's a, it's a great conversation starter. Astronomy and mythology, using storytelling to understand culture and history. We know a lot of Greek and Roman mythology. We're going to do a different one. And uh, I like this here. I mean, there's a book actually called The Myth Maker. I think that's awesome. Uh, uh, modern mythology, Harry Potter. Uh, Harry Potter is a big part of the classes I teach. Probably not the honors section. I don't think the Buchanan's have heard any of this stuff. Um, except for the, the astronomical errors in the book, right? All, we've discussed all the astronomical errors that are in the, in the book. But it's the best-selling book series of all time, 450 million volumes in 64 languages since 1997. Books, movies, theme parks, merchandise, and so forth is valued in the tens of billions of dollars. I think it's, gonna, I think it's left a, a mark on history that will never go away. It'll never go away. We're going to talk about these books. <laughs> we, as like, I'm going to be there. You know, we go far enough in the future. I think people will be talking about these books and just how amazing they are. Um, uh, the, the astronomical errors that I pointed out, they're both in the fifth book, but at the end of Harry's fifth year, which was early June, he claimed to be able to see Venus and Orion from the astronomy tower at midnight. Now, if you take a basic astronomy class from me, I will teach you <laughs> that that's impossible. But not because I said it, because you can demonstrate that that's true. That does not take away from the story, but that's just one of those things that opens the door to, you know, writing, writing uh, you know, popular literature that crosses over with science. That's sort of an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, historical debates regarding heliocentrism and geocentrism. The observations that show that this is impossible actually were key elements in this debate that lasted for centuries. Okay, And so that's kind of a nice springboard there. Uh, by the way, in case anybody's keeping score, not only is astronomy a liberal art, it's also the only subject at Hogwarts. I I'm not keeping score. Yeah, yeah. Chemists do not, no. Potions is not chemistry. They don't drink that stuff. <laughs> and I, I always think this is hilarious. Hermione, look at that, knows the grindstone. Look where her telescope's pointing. His, he's always worried about what's going on. He's the hero. He's always playing the hero card. And this guy's just zoned out. <laughs> so there's three ways you can use a telescope, and they're all right there. I think that's pretty funny. Uh, I actually took this photograph with my iPhone. Uh, the, the soundstage in London that was used to shoot all the movies, uh, it was, a, it was, a, uh, it was the, uh, being used for about a decade, um, all the sets were left intact. And now it's a museum. And uh, we flew over there, and this is an actual photograph of the tapestry. As you can see, it's got, uh, uh, anyway, I've got a translation of all this. But uh, basically, the most noble and ancient family of black is what it says here in Latin. Um, wizards with star names. This is something we just finished doing at my non-honors astronomy 1030, just making connections because we're learning the constellations, we're learning about stars, and making connections with modern mythology. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, anyway, but Sirius, believe it or not, if you look at that tapestry, that's Harry's godfather and it's his third cousin. Because all the families are related. Remember this pure blood mania that has, you know, people will make marriage choices uh, that are probably less than wise, okay? Um, as you know about the Gaunt family. The Gaunt family kind of took it to an extreme, right? Regulus, of course, is Sirius's brother. These are, that's the brightest star in the Canis Major, the brightest star in Leo. Arcturus is the brightest star in the Herdsman of Boötis. But that's Sirius, the Regulus' grandfather. Bellatrix, which means warrior woman, literally, is part of Orion. And Bellatrix Lestrange was, in fact, uh, uh, like, like, almost like Voldemort's sergeant-at-arms. That's Harry's second cousin. They're related. <laughs> uh, what about uh, constellation names? Cassiopeia, Harry and Bellatrix great aunt. That's where they connect. They have the same great aunt. Orion is Sirius and Regulus' father. Cygnus is Bellatrix's father. Andromeda is Bellatrix, Bellatrix's sister. Draco is Harry's arch enemy, and he's his second cousin once removed. They're related. <laughs> They're related because I saw the, I looked at the tapestry. And uh, Scorpius is Draco's son. But these are all astronomy names. And just to kind of tie this in, because long before we were here, this is exactly what people did. 
That's exactly what they did when they started looking at all the different constellations. In our astronomy lab class, we actually um, look at other cultures besides Western. Here's the picture. Uh, it's kind of cartoonized, uh, always pure. And uh, there you go. But uh, I want to go through here quickly. But, um, but you can see they're all connected. Anyway, everybody up here has the last name of Black up here. So when you come down, you'll see that by marriage, some of their names change. But this is the family of Black. Don't have time to hang out on this one. Sorry. Now here, here's an alternate view. And this is something I want to throw out there. Um, I probably have to go quickly. I've used up all my time. Here's an alternate view to doing science. Stephen Hawking, we know who he is. He's uh, a lot of people would probably think if we were to list the 10 smartest people in the world alive today, he'd definitely be on that list. In fact, he's probably one of the few who'd be on everybody's list. Okay? And he's done a lot of great work. He's an expert in relativity. He's a mathematician. Um, don't read that. I'm going <laughs> to. I got it here. I want to read from this. This is from page five. By the way, this is a great book, The Grand Design. Here he argues for a universe that is actually designed, which is interesting. But to him, the designer is mathematics. Okay, he takes you down that road. Okay. Um, it's funny that page five isn't the fifth page. Okay, now there we are. Okay. We each exist for but a short time. And in that time, explore but a small part of the whole universe. But humans are a curious species. We wonder. We seek answers. Living in the vast world that is by turns kind and cruel, and gazing at the immense heavens above, people have always asked a multitude of questions. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? Did the universe need a creator? Most of us do not spend most of our time worrying about these questions, but almost all of us worry about them uh, some of the time. I would argue these are probably the most interesting questions to me. I think these are very fascinating questions, although I love to know how black holes work. But I think these are very, very important. Traditionally, these, questions for, uh, these are questions for philosophy. But philosophy is dead. <laughs> yes, it's right here. Philosophy is, in fact, dead. Philosophy has not kept up with modern development in science, particularly physics. I'd like to see him defend that statement, because I didn't know philosophy required that relationship. Anyway, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. The purpose of this book is to give the answers that are suggested by recent discoveries and theoretical advances. Um, he goes on in the book, which I didn't up here, but he's arguing not to integrate, to divorce. Let's put all our eggs in the science basket, because scientists invented the laser. Scientists got, sent men to the moon and brought them back. Scientists are discovering you know, gravitational waves. Science, science, science. Okay? And he wants to put all our eggs in that basket. I would, I would recoil from that personally. Uh, I understand where he's coming from. And since it's a scientist who's saying it, maybe there's an ulterior motive. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but he describes the book as a proposal for a new concept that can be traced back almost a century. And I've got a quote that comes back from almost a century. We've got Bertrand Russell, a philosopher, logician, mathematician, <laughs> historian. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature. He said this uh, in his paper, Religion and Science. While it is true that science cannot decide questions of value, that is because they cannot be intellectually decided at all. And a question of value are those ultimate questions that were in that list that Stephen Hawking gave to us, that first list. And they lie outside the realm of truth and falsehood. What knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Now, we should be gracious at this point and say, well, maybe what he means is, maybe he's drawing a distinction between absolute proof and probable proof. And with those definitions, then maybe what he's saying is true, because science does have a means by which we validate whether something is true or false, and maybe everything else is done uh, in a different way. The problem with this quote, even though people have uh, kind of jumped on it, is that his statement was not discovered using scientific method. <laughs> it wasn't. It's a self-defeating argument. Okay? He gener this is a question of value. And he's arguing that questions of value are unanswerable. But yet, this whole idea that this is the way science works is answering a question of value. How does science work? You see? And science did not give us this statement. It came from his worldview and his philosophy. Question of value. There you go. 
So, uh, but people have been thinking that way for quite a while. Antony Flew, this is an extreme example. Uh, when I say extreme, you have to be very careful. Scientists do all the time. They take their best data point and call it typical. We always had a joke about that. Find your, your best data point, publish it, and call it typical. Yeah, that's bad news. That's called being a human doing science. Anyway, but Antony Flew, this is an extreme example. So this is very, very uncommon. He was an English philosopher, most notable for his work related to the philosophy of religion. Throughout his career, he was known as a strong advocate, if not a leading advocate of atheism, arguing that one should presuppose atheism until empirical evidence of a God surfaces. Today, we call that methodological naturalism. And all scientists that I know, including myself, and I'm a theist, we buy into this, OK? This is the way you do science. This is the way you do science. So nobody's going nobody's to really dispute that. You know, uh, it's a methodological process. However, in 2004, he announced his transition to deism. He stated that in keeping his lifelong commitment to go where the evidence leads, he now believed in the existence of a god, a conclusion not directly attainable from scientific methods. When you read his book, when you read his book, okay, there it is. There is a god, because you remember he was like a leading atheist for a very long time. The book outlining his reasons for changing his position, There is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind, outlines his integrated <laughs> approach to addressing questions of value. He literally broke down and said, you know, we got to look at all the data. And he's arguing, this is where the data lead if you take it seriously. You don't have to agree with him, but that's sort of just an example of where a person, I would say this is a pretty radical shift just from letting all the data speak for themselves and just trying to take an integrated approach. Back to the car analogy, we're almost done. If I could find out which button to press next. Cars are amazing because they're an integrated system, right? Brakes are extremely important. In fact, without brakes, cars would not only fail to perform their function, they would be dangerous, if not lethal, OK? However, just because brakes are extremely important for the proper function of a car and lethal to operate a car without them, that is not a reason to assume that the best way to drive a car is always with the brakes on. I mean, brakes have a long history of doing great things. Look at all the things that brakes have done over history. Therefore, we should only apply the brakes when we drive. Wow. That didn't come out of page five, but it almost did. OK, similarly, just because science, including astronomy, my own field, is extremely important to the proper function of society and culture, and I would say unquestionably dangerous to live without, think about engineering, iPhones. You know, think about um, medicine, medical breakthroughs, okay? Safety uh, bridges that are built well, okay? That is not a reason to assume that the best way to address all the questions of life is to put all our eggs in the science basket. Why is that? Okay, so do not block the intersection by overly applying your brakes. That's the whole trivium thing. Don't block the intersection. We can choose to defer complete authority for the answers to our ultimate questions to science. You can do that. No one's saying that you can't do it. Or you can just say all questions in general. But a liberal education reminds us that we don't have to. Look at this. This is where you lost your wallet? No, I lost it in the park. But this is where the light is. You see that? This is science. And even if the answer's over here, do we really want to always draw our answers from here? Sometimes you do, if it's something with medicine how to build a better telescope, how to design a faster computer. I kind of get that, but what about questions of value? That's it. I barely made it. <laughs> All right, what happens next? I have some time for questions. Ah, oh, cool. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> OK, so earlier when you were talking about um, the, the existence of, of Earth 2.0, and that we basically haven't discovered any so far that are very <laughs> Whenever you see one, there's always kind of a, 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 a last sentence that says, well, it's not really, or there's a retraction. How would you, you're familiar with the Fermi Paradox, I assume. Yes. How would you feel this would affect the like, way you would interpret the Fermi Paradox? I mean, I, know, I don't know how far we've managed to look as far as mm -hmm. this is concerned, but that you know, put sort of a damper on the whole idea. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm assuming that not all of us are familiar with the Fermi Paradox, but Enrico Fermi was, a, was, a, uh, was an Italian physicist. Uh, during that period when Einstein was alive. And what you're dealing with is, when you're dealing with this framework, okay, um, there's, a, there's, an, there's an analogous paradox called Olbert's paradox. And Olbert's paradox is, why is the sky dark at night? Because at the time when people like Einstein in that period, maybe just a little bit before that, people were arguing that the universe had to be infinitely large 
implying that it contains an infinite number of light sources and infinitely old, meaning there's sufficient time for light from those light sources to reach Earth. And they were arguing, if that was true, then why is the night sky dark at night? Okay. Uh, the most common uh, counterargument was the fact that there's presence of dust. But remember, dust has been absorbing energy forever, so that dust itself would be glowing. So generally, Olbert's paradox has been used as a way to illustrate that the universe hasn't always been here, and it doesn't contain an infinite number of light sources. Fermi, the Fermi's paradox is, everybody, he, he, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. I'm trying to tell a story. Everybody says, life's everywhere. It's over there. It's there. Look at all these Earths. You know, it, it, there's uh, all these aliens. They're going to come talk to us someday. And Fermi just mentioned at lunch one day, well, where are they? Where are they? Because it's the same argument. Um, if stars are light sources that produce photons, and there's been plenty of time for those photons to reach Earth, by analogy, you could look at all these so-called so Earth-like planets that exist, and if those don't emit photons but emit aliens, it sounds kind of funny, but I'm making a point, then the odds are we should have met them by now. And I, and I know this is, a, a, this is a can of worms in itself. Uh, we hear a lot of interesting stories. Uh, about aliens and uh, the, the black mailbox and all that business uh, out there. Anyway, but uh, so the whole idea is Fermi's paradox, why haven't we seen them yet? Maybe they don't exist. And the Earth 2.0 thing, yeah, I would say that's part of it. Um, but I think the data are too premature. I'm confident we're going to find dozens, if not hundreds, maybe more Earth 2.0s. It's just a matter of time. So, yeah. Anybody else? Well, anything? <laughs> well, that's cool. I mean, maybe we go home early. Is that a good thing? All right. <laughs>